Hello everyone, Holly Shields here for Calkine TV and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. A 20 minute roundup with Sarah Sheridan, co-founder and director of operations of Clothing the Gaps. We bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how we can create multiple passive income streams. In today's show, we have Sarah Sheridan, co-founder and director of operations of Clothing the Gaps. Welcome, Sarah. It's a pleasure e-meeting with you. Hi, Holly. Thanks so much for having me on. It's, um, it's really great to get to connect with your audience today and um, looking forward to sharing a little bit of the Clothing the Gaps story with you. Definitely. Thanks for joining us. So let's kick it off. Prior to launching your label, did you see a gap in the market with respect to the rising demand for ethical fashion? Yeah, it's a really great question. And I think this is a shift that's been happening certainly within Australia, but also across the globe in terms of conscious consumerism. Um, there's been, I think it's been building for quite some time and I think we all had a lot of time to reflect over COVID. Um, around what that meant to us. But for us, in terms of the growth of Clothing the Gaps, it's been a very organic um, journey. We, the, the story of Clothing the Gaps is actually quite unique. Um, my co-founder, Laura Thompson, and managing director is a Guni Jamara woman, and we met working together at the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service, running health and wellbeing programs and creating impact in, um, in healthy lifestyles alongside Aboriginal communities, yeah, not just in Melbourne, but right across Victoria. And... Um, one of the things that we'd always found was so important was a, a really great piece of merchandise that reinforced cultural identity and, and connected people together. So for us, merch has always been a really powerful piece that is able to convey um, values and messages. So when we, um, when we stepped out into business as a new way of doing things, it was a dream of ours to be able to one day perhaps produce enough pieces of, of merch and sell them to the general public and, and to the Aboriginal community as well to get to represent um, their own cultural identity. And But to be able to self-fund the work of impact that we wanted to do to be independent of government funding. And that's where we see ourselves today, which is really exciting. That is really exciting. That's um, quite a journey that you've been on. So your label holds an accreditation from the ECA and is the process of registering with Social Traders and B Corporation Australia. As you mentioned, what's the significance of these certifications for you? Yeah, for us, having Ethical Clothing Australia accreditation is really important because for um, manufacturing in Australia, I think there's a, a general assumption that just because something's Australian made, that it's also made ethically. However, undervaluing of um, human resources, uh, working conditions, um, the time given to create garments is not always... Um, it's not always above board, even in Australia, sadly. And to ensure that every single person is valued and protected and safe in our supply chain is so important to us. And the Ethical Clothing Australia accreditation is a is an independent stamp to be able to say that, that that's happened in that process and that we're protecting and supporting our workers in our supply chain. We're really proud that uh, a, a growing number of products on our range are 100% Australian made and not just Australian made, but they're actually made on Wurundjeri country in Melbourne, um, just a few kilometres down from our, our HQ store on Sydney Road in Brunswick. So we're really proud to be supporting the local manufacturing economy in Australia um, to be, yeah, to be able to reduce our um, environmental impact in that way. And then, yeah, anything that isn't 100% Australian made is, um, is able to be source mapped right through um, really strong supply chains and really clear and transparent processes and then finished and tagged in, in, in Melbourne. So for us, the independence, um, sorry, the independent review of, of bodies like ECA, and then being able to register with social traders as a social enterprise, and then B Corp going through that process as well. We can talk all we want about how we wanna be the best and most responsible business um, that we can be. But to be able to have an independent person review those processes and have go through a structured framework, see where we could grow, see where we can keep challenging ourselves, that's really important to us. And it, it gives our supporters the confidence to know that we really are striving to do the best that we can in this space. 
Definitely, that's very impressive. And um, you mentioned being a social enterprise. How would you describe the unique challenges and rewards of operating a social enterprise? Absolutely. I think when I think about social enterprise, so as a non-Aboriginal person um, in partnership in Aboriginal business, when, when I think of social enterprise, I think of the way of doing business that puts people first and is a, is a unique lever to be able to use business as an impact for good. Um, within the space that, that Clothing the Gaps operates, it's incredible and it's an incredible challenge to have to be able to um, to be challenged of how we tell the story of our impact to its fullest because it's so deep within the structure of the business. It's so vast in the in the messages and the campaigns that we push for. Um, it's not just about physical dollar product, but it's also about you know who who works with us, who we work with, the ways in which we work with other people. So um, I think that the challenge of social enterprise is that people presume that it's just about the actual profit value that gets reinvested back into the impact piece. But I think that's where being um, going through the B Corp registration process as well, it speaks to the, the depth of the, the impact as well. So having the two side by side, I think they're a really great partnership piece. Within the social enterprise piece, the, the most important thing for us as well is to be a successful and sustainable business because if we're not a successful and sustainable business, then the impact isn't there and the impact doesn't have the longevity um, that we want to have, we, that we want to see. So for us, we reinvest our profits back into the Clothing the Gaps Foundation. The Clothing the Gaps Foundation is an Aboriginal-led not-for-profit with the aim of adding years to Aboriginal people's lives. So our name, Clothing the Gaps, is a play on the national government campaign close the gaps uh, close the gap and um now that we've added the s due to our recent uh name change we uh, are it speaks to the many gaps that there are for us to work on so um so we the the foundation is focused on um getting aboriginal people more active right across the country we work with aboriginal community groups and organizations to support them to run their own virtual movement events so we run two um like fun runs, I guess, a year. So we're coming up to the NADOC fun run, which is why as I'm up on Larrakee country in, in Darwin today, I've been out training for the, the NADOC Hill Country event this morning along the foreshore. It's been beautiful. It's a, it's a great way to um, connect communities together, to get people moving and to take that time to, to connect um yeah, with country and, and each other in that. So for us, yeah, the, the profits from the sales of the tea go straight back into, um, yeah, being able to, to run those events right across right across communities. So we're really excited that a T-shirt can make that really big impact. Right. I mean, that seems like very important and rewarding work. And you clearly do a lot of other work outside of just uh, the merch side of the business. But, Absolutely, uh, that, yeah. Right. With that label, though, um, how has the rebranding of it impacted the business? Yeah, look, it's been, a, it's been a really big process. So for people that are unfamiliar with where we're currently sitting in terms of our rebrand, after a two-year legal dispute with um, US Giant Clothing Gap, we are now rebranding. We, we lost a... Um, we lost a, a, a case in the um, Trademarks Tribunal where we, we obviously fought, that's what we do, um, to keep our name. We then negotiated with Gap to add an S. We changed the stylization of the branding, um, which was approved by them. Um, and now we are in the process of, of having to clear out all of our excess stock that is um, has the original branding of Clothing the Gap prior to the 31st of July. So it's meant everything from domain names, tags, labels, um, absolutely everything, signage on buildings, everything's had to change. So look, it's, it's, uh, it's been a, a really large process for us. We're a very small team. We might look really big on social media, but we actually have a very small hub of people who work across multitudes of jobs and, and roles to to do what we do. Um, so it, it has taken quite a lot of time. For, for two years, we've had the uncertainty of, of what our name was actually going to be, but we just trusted that our community of supporters would come with us on this journey and, and we're so grateful for their support. It's them that's kept us, um, kept us, I guess, 
a little bit sane throughout this process of just not really knowing what we were going to be called. But, yes, yeah, it's, it's been quite the process. So we've had to change, yeah, absolutely everything. Wow. It sounds like a bit of an uphill battle. It, it has been it has been challenging, but, you know, with those moments come the opportunity to revisit every label or piece of product packaging that we've ever designed to make it that little bit better, to add those next level details. Um, so we've taken, you know, as we do with most things, we've taken it as the opportunity to fine tune and, and really um, nail some of those extra messages on things with an opportunity to do it again. It's also been incredible to see... Um, yeah, the community support for helping us clear out all of the original branded stock. We're incredibly grateful for everybody that's backed us and sent us messages of support. Um, yeah, it's been it's been an interesting process. I think, um, you know, IP and trademarks and copyright and all of those things, it's a very complex space. I think it also probably just speaks to, um, you know, when Laura and I started in business together, like we're health promotion practitioners as as a background, we're not, um, you know, we didn't come from a traditional business um, schooling background in that sense. So we've learned a lot along the way. And I think this is one of those really big learning, learning moments for us. Wow, yeah, that is great to hear. Very inspirational, I think. Um, and just back to the uh, Clothing the Gaps Foundation, you mentioned that it mm. diverges from traditional funding models. Could you explain a bit more about that? For sure. So we're really proud that the foundation can deliver the work across Aboriginal communities and supporting them to run their own virtual movement events because people support and and wear their values on their tees and um, as a social enterprise, that's where that funding stream come, comes from. So to be able to, to do that independent of um, of government funding at this stage is, is really unique. So for us, it means that we can be incredibly agile. Um, you know, we're able to deliver the work that the Aboriginal community ask of us on the ground. Um, we're not, you know, jumping back through hoops, through if anyone's familiar with government funding models and what that looks like. It can sometimes be great and sometimes it can be incredibly challenging. And so for us to be able to be really independent of that, it also means that we're not a part of of the wider system. It means that as a, an Aboriginal-led not-for-profit, um, yeah, we can be incredibly responsive to communities' needs and, and sets the, the Aboriginal community can set the direction of, of what that impact should look like. So in terms of self-determination um, and not relying on, on government funding, it's, it's really exciting. It's very unique. Right. It does sound that way, definitely. And now just to the sustainability side of the business, Every 10 minutes, Australians dump 15 tonnes of clothing and fabric waste, making our fashion industry one of the highest polluting industries. Do you see conscious consumerism as an antidote to fast fashion? Yeah, I, I really do. I think, you know, this is something that we're incredibly aware of. And this is the beauty of being able to manufacture locally and the importance of building those relationships with suppliers within um, within your supply chain, but also within your region. So for us, we're, a, you know, a few short Ks away from our factory, which means that, you know, at least once or twice a week, we're, we're popping in and out of there to check in, um, see where things are up to, sample things. It also means that that creates opportunities to see where the excess fabric is at um, and then to be able to get creative with what we do with it to stop our own excess um, fabric in the production process um, from going to landfill as well. So we've created a like a, a baby bib um, uh, out of the excess piece of fabric underneath the armhole of some of our t-shirts. So that was a really creative way to be able to maximise the fabric and stop that from going to landfill. But in terms of the other end, in, once it's purchased, we really see um, people wanting to, to I guess, collect a series of message-based T-shirts from us. We see people who um, have, you know, they, we have our return customer um, rates are really high. So we see people wanting to collect all of the all of the bits and add them to their wardrobe, which we love. But I think as you know. With Australian made products as well, it gives us the opportunity to ensure that we're producing a really high quality product that has long lasting wear and that people know that they're going to get to cherish and wear their values on their tea for, for 
for you know a number of seasons not just a fast fashion approach of you know wear it and and kind of move on to the next the next thing so i really think as i mentioned at the start of our chat holly the opportunity throughout COVID for people to really reflect on what that looked like and you know every dollar that we spend in the way that we live our lives is a is a vote cast in the world that we want to see for tomorrow and the opportunity to reject the values of fast fashion and start thinking consciously about where we spend our our money and and what kinds of clothes that we buy um, plays a really big part in that it's yeah it's really important and the shift has been yeah has been quite quite large. Definitely and it seems like it's still heading that way. Um, mm. What do you see the future of the ethical clothing industry looking like in Australia? I think as the um, understanding of what it means for something to be ethically created are growing um, and you know people like Ethical Clothing Australia are doing an incredible job in championing that awareness across the market. Um, I really see that people will start to understand that, you know, they can't pay $7 for a T-shirt from somewhere and, and it not be impactful and harmful, impact in a harmful way somewhere along the line. I think people are really starting to understand that that's just not realistic. So I think people's um, expectations are really starting to shift. So I really see that with more um, awareness and education around the impacts of fast fashion, especially, you know, not just from a, an environmental point of view, but also from a, a human rights and a workers' rights point of view as well. I think people are really starting to, to understand what that means. And I mean, this conversation has been going for a very long time. Like, you know, the, the conversation around, you know, child slavery in, in factories across the globe has been um, has been a huge issue for, for a number of years. And there's some fantastic apps where you can check in on, you know, where your favourite brands are at with, with these indicators um, and you can actively choose and be informed around what you're choosing to buy and support. So I see the future of, of, of this being quite strong. I see people being armed with more information to be able to make the choices. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's really encouraging to see that shift happening so fast coming out of, you know, the, the pandemic as well of, of that, that, really important, that really important piece in, in valuing the communities and the society around us. All right. That seems like a very bright outlook, actually. Um, and definitely education is key. So actually, that was um, the end of our interview just now. And that was a fabulous show. I have to say it was lovely chatting with you, Sarah. We thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Holly. And just, yeah, really encourage anybody that's um, listening that isn't familiar with the Closing the Gaps um, story just yet, come and join the come and join the family over on social media. Um, we're really active in that space um, and we look forward to bringing you along the journey with us. And thanks so much for, um, for having me on the show today, Holly. Yes, definitely everyone check that out. And once again, thanks for joining us, Sarah.